the next step comes because of what the last step was. I don't know what that is. And the best pieces are the ones that I didn't get in the way too much. Just because you're making knives, you're seeing things that are coming from somewhere else. Oh, absolutely. As, as you're progressing through the design, you're seeing what the next best decision for that design is. Yeah, the customs I'm doing today, most of those, I have no clue what that knife's gonna be. Just, just for context, when CRKT kind of approached me about this, I got, I got very excited because I think there's, on, on the knife maker side of the industry, we're so used to spending time like this and the production side is, is different, right? A lot of us, you know, don't love being on camera or right, the conversations yeah. and the questions and everything else. Is, is pretty unfamiliar. And so on a completely self-serving level, the, the opportunity to just sit with you in like a quiet space and have a conversation about like an industry that has probably given both of us like a lot of good in our lives. Absolutely. Was, was a pretty big deal. So I, I wanna say thank you for being willing well, to do this. Th thank you, you know, so yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't quite know what the mission was, you know, but, but I'm good with what, <laughs> however, where we go here, you know. Me either. I you think, know, but I, I can bullshit about knives. As, <laughs> yeah, well, and that's what <laughs> we're usually doing. Time, you know? Yeah, that's, the, the industry, even in the, t I've been in 20 years, and the, the way the information has transferred has shifted so much in that like you look at social media now to be it i think to be a current knife maker you have to have like a presence and people are starting to learn about you and see your personality and your opinions and i mean it's really broad spectrum right earlier generations of knife makers you got, it was all face to face it was all knife shows yeah all you, knife shows if you didn't do that you were dead yeah you, you were you weren't going to sell anything right. you might go to a little local thing but if you didn't do the major shows you were going nowhere you're going nowhere and yeah. now it's like almost social media in a way i've always said that shows like they're it's a 100 percent necessity for the long run because regardless of how much kind of visibility you can get you can't build the relationships you can't build you can't build the friendships you know? No, but you can you could do the sales. You, you can do the sales. You, you can you could uh, you know there's uh, I see some knife makers doing really well. I've never been to a knife show. Yep. You know, um, I wonder about the long haul there. Right? That's yeah, the question, you know, right? Um, does that uh, maybe it does? I don't know. I, yeah. um, I I didn't you know I'm a hermit. I don't know anything about social media, and it was. You know, 20, I'm going to say 14, 15, maybe I went in when I did the Instagram thing. It was because my, my better half, you know, I said, what, what's going on? It, everything's changing here, yeah. you know. She says, if you don't get on social media, you're toast, dude. You better, right. you better learn it. I said, nah, it's not my thing. I'm not going to do that, uh, blah, 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 but, you know. But I've, you know, I've met a lot of people through Instagram. That's how most people contact me right. now, you know. Um, it's communication. I and mean, that's yeah. the big, big thing is communication platform. But there's, like, for your time in the industry and, like, everything that you have done for and given the industry, information on you is so hard. Like, you as, a, as, as Michael Walker is hard to find. Like, you can go on social media and, like, you know, people see like the sports I'm doing or they see what I'm eating. I mean, it's just like, it, it's an amalgamation over years and years where you can kind of get to know people. And that's where I think the production side benefits from, I think, conversations like this, because like the knives are really, really important. But I think like the relationships and kind of the backstories to some of this stuff, I think is, where a lot of the interest really lies. I'd say that, I mean, for a lot of collectors, like the product is one element of the whole. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. For for um, different areas, you know, if um, you're interested in whatever, that that more detailed about the, right. the relationships and the person, uh, you know, uh, more you're interested in that subject, the more you wanna know most right. people, yeah. Well, you know. and with, with your work, 
you when you started, you were doing what all knife makers do, which is probably making like a pretty utilitarian knife. I made I made ten stick knives. Yep. And um, a friend of mine at the time had a little shop in Red River, New Mexico. I went in there to buy a fishing license, actually. <laughs> even though I'm not much of a fisherman and never really cared for it. But for some reason, somebody gave me a fly rod or something, I thought I needed a license. And he had custom knives in this little shop in Red River, New Mexico. And um, uh, I wasn't making knives. Yeah, I was still, you know, still trying to get to, the, get to that spot, you know. But met this guy, you know. Uh, um, I uh, um, thought, well, I'm, I, I was trying to get to a spot where I could make something you know right. i was pretty good silversmith you know so i had some basic tools so okay i want to i want to stop it where okay so you were silversmithing yeah i was making jewelry and selling firewood i'm real good with the chainsaw okay and this is you're living in new i still think one of the reasons they set me down with you is because we're both from new mexico so <laughs> you ended up in new mexico when uh 1977 that's when i built that little geodesic dome up geodesic there dome. yeah so we it took, still took me night. three more years to get to, to make a to make a knife you know and you were doing what type of silversmithing were you doing uh, i i made um uh turquoise style with a little more contemporary flair to it you know um, um charles lolama would, oh, yeah. would be my hero in that in that area of work you know so um <clears throat> But it just wasn't mechanical enough for me. Right. You know, it was um, it was easy enough to do, you know, uh, for what I was doing. You know, you didn't need, you know, I came I came to New Mexico with with my jewelry tools rolled up in a T-shirt, and then I had one little lapidary thing. So that yeah. was the tools I had when I when I got started. You know, so um, where where if your work then. Cause you have your, I've seen a few of your sculptures. When you started making knives, did you come at it from an artistic thought process or from a tool process? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, uh, when I got out of the army, I, I did a couple of years of, uh, of college, but I, I, uh, I took sculpture <laughs> Salesmanship and in uh, business law, you know, uh, <laughs> I wasn't after anything in particular. I yeah, was just actually after, all kind of ties in <laughs> after stuff that maybe maybe would serve me. So yeah, I had that. You know, I liked the art end of, of things. Um, um, ne never thought about real, being a sculptor or anything, but I was. You know, but I liked that work. But you have a you sculptural know? quality to, and some of your detail. I mean, you see. I think a lot of times when you look at people's work, like you see the the sparks there's origins that didn't just exist from this one kind of um canvas like just because you're making knives you're seeing things that are coming from somewhere else well, absolutely most when people ask me about how i make you know the, the customs i'm doing today most of those i don't know what that knife is good i have no clue what that knife is going to be i i know i I know what lock I'm going to use. I pick that, so I'm restrained by I'm restrained by whatever mechanism I decide to use. But then it's just some rectangles off of that. And w when I get the mechanics set and move on, I start shaping things till I like the way they look. And uh, then when I'll get to the uh, say it's the gold inlay or the sculpting of the handle or something, e each one of those steps. Uh, the next step comes because of what the last step was. I don't know what that is. And the best pieces are the ones that I didn't get in the way too much. Okay, I let them, I let them go, right? right. I let them go and, and uh, some, some turn out better than others. But, but that way, uh, uh, it's more enjoyable for me not knowing. Right, because you know? it keeps it yeah. new and you're learning as you're progressing right and you 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 learn so much more that way right than having right. it all figured out for me than having it all figured out before i start it's um, interesting because and not everybody does that that's one of the things like i think knife making has kept me engaged for so long because of those differences so like i i think maybe it was like wolfgang lochner 
he was saying that like he fully renders the entire knife so that he can know exactly like how he can like file in flutes and that's a very different he can, he can picture the whole thing it. i'm the, i can't picture it I always can't at the end right so you're okay yours is like an iterative process as you're progressing through the design you're seeing what the next best decision for that design is yeah, and you can get stuck you know the place i get stuck the most is when i've got everything shaped i've got the lock sort of figured out but now I got to get down to that um, artistic little stuff where I'm going to put some gold in there. I'm going to do something to give this a little, a little uh, uh, personality or, right. or uh, something. So uh, that, that I, may, I may be scratching my head for a, a couple of days. Uh, it's, it's not a good business model because no. I can't do no. anything else. Uh, right. I, can't That's go, full. I can't go work on another knife. Yep. I, I can't do anything. I got to figure that out before I can do anything else. So um, <laughs> sometimes it's pretty frustrating because, you know, you, you know that's there and you know it's going to come, but you may do a few false starts and stuff. But, you know, uh, like I said, if I don't get in the way too much, it'll wherever, wherever that kind of inspiration comes from, hopefully it flows through. Something like this, I certainly had to be more, you know, a prototype and stuff. You got to be different more, thought process. Yes, right? di different, different way. You got to, you got to have stuff figured, kind of figured out ahead of time, and and um, you can still do some experimenting to get to the, to get to the end. But sure. a little different process. Always one knife at a time. And for the last thirty-five years, I guess. In the beginning, no, I'd I'd try six, and and then I. Uh, I, I'd never get to the six the same. Right. I'm going to make six just like this. I never. I it's never, hard. I never could. No. Yeah. I, 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 I've, all, I've always really struggled with that, and I'm. I'm not doing art knives, but it's small details that are what's interesting to me. And doing batch work, I just struggle with it. I find I, I did. I'll do three knives sometimes, and I, I just enjoy making changes. You know, I want the efficiency of more knives. That would be great. It is. That, that, <laughs> that's, 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 the, that's the problem there. Yeah. It's like uh, I, I do setups on the Panagraph that take an hour, hour yeah. and a half to set up. And I might, whatever I'm doing might only take one, two, three minutes. Yeah. If I was doing six pieces, I'm already set up. I run those six. Right. Um, I, I got those four or five minutes times the six, but here I, I, I have to tear it down to use it for the, right. for the next little thing. Next so thing. It, it's, it's not a time efficient, uh, thing, thing at all. Right. But, but um, it's more about how, how to get, um, probably for me now, it's more the journey through the knife than it is the the finished um, piece. Yeah. So the work, yeah. the interest yeah. is in the work. Yeah. You know. Um, has that has that been that way for a long time? I mean, have you? Um, yeah, I, I think, but more of the emphasis was on f for me. What drives me is finding that next thing, <laughs> finding the next liner lock. Let's say you know uh, the mechanics. You know. Um, um, th those, those things, the, the, and, and, uh, other treatments and stuff I've refined and refined and refined o over time, but the, the more interest is it in the, probably the, the mechanics there and, and to, to just find any little thing that, you know, wasn't done, you wasn't know, that done. Was, you know, that's another, I mean, that's another area of knife making where. Like I'm not a, I'm not a mechanism maker and working like I've worked with CRKT for I think a decade now kind of like I'm in a powerhouse of people that are very very smart you know it's like you Ken Flavio the, these guys that see mechanisms and how to apply them in a way that my brain does not work and so I'm always curious if that is like if it the root of a design is like the mechanism or when you're thinking of a new mechanism where is your mind what is it was you know I'm usually just doodling you know and and 
you know, I've done so many locks now, you know, one collector told me he's got over 30, so I don't know how, a different one, so I don't know how many, but at a point there's, it's just harder and harder and harder to find a, 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 any, a new thing that's actually um, not just a gimmick. Right. Uh, okay. Or is functional, because you yes. still, for as as art based as your knives are, like a lot of your lines are like very functional lines. Like you, you are still have that somewhere rolling in a, what a knife is. Well, that that form follows function thing has always been f paramount for me. Yeah, you know, um, different for the sake of different is right. not not uh, not a good goal for me. But 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 finding those details or the the mechanics, but but I don't focus so much on the the new locks as much as I used to because yeah. I'm just you know um, um, I've tried to refine some of some of the others that I've been using. I'll, I I I I have one that just came back to me that that uh, took a couple scratches out of. And I could not remember how in the hell I did that. Okay, it's like I looked at it before how I took it, it apart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how that thing worked inside, you know. I'm going. Uh, there's a little. There was a little sliding thing, you know. And I'm going. Well, what is that doing it inside? You know, there's a lot of possibilities there. But until I took it apart, I could not remember how because I'd only made the one. It was. It was this right. brilliant, great idea. By the time I got the one done, it worked fine. It was cool for that one, but I was on to something else and and forgot about it and uh, uh went on went on you know uh, hunting the next uh, the next thing you know do you do you work knife to knife like do you always have a project going no or do you need like a cool down period no i don't need not not a uh, period as much but i don't think about and the next one until i in the back, maybe something's turning around there, sure. you know, um, something you want to try. Uh, but um, but usually when, when that one's done, then I start figuring out. And I'll start three or four <laughs> things, I'll, you know, and they're not doing it for me, you know. Right. So I got this drawer full of <laughs> started things that uh, I just lost interest in, you know, till I find the one that, okay, you know, maybe I that I'll, I'll want to carry it all the way through. So I have a lot of these started things or, or um, just stuff that I thought was, I liked and when I got started, I didn't so much. Yeah, and, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, some, yeah. I do the same thing. Like I'll look at it on paper and I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> and then I'll go, I'll go make a template and I'm like, that doesn't look good at all. And then, like, I don't know where that transition happened. It's something about like a two, and you're not even you're not even necessarily sketching. So you're you're essentially removing until you see a line that you don't like. Yeah, and you go too far. Too, you go but, too far. But but I I, uh, I I'll do sometimes some simple um, just quick quick sketch to to see. But usually I can't see that from a from a sketch. I usually can't can't see it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, so that's why I start wherever the mechanism is and just work work my way so, out so you start mechanism first yeah so because it, that, that then, that's your constraint yeah you, you know you've got to build everything around um uh, around that you know uh, like with, with, with a blade lock you've got to have two hardened liners you know so you're looking at different materials too um whereas some of the other locks i can use the titanium handle so you're also you're constrained by the the lock constrains your your design and it, it uh, puts the constraints on your material you know uh, different materials you know right. uh, what you have to use you know that uh, that's why most of my most of my blade locks usually have uh, steel or damascus handles because i have to heat treat the handle right you know so um so i'm i'm, I'm coming from so a you different have hard, area. yeah you have hard limitations around some of these yeah. mechanisms man it's so it, it just like process wise it's so interesting like i looking looking at a lot of your knives i think too there's there's a context right now that is lost because of modern manufacturing techniques so like a lot like i was looking at a knife that you did that was 
it was engraved and anodized. So that would have been, I mean, what is it like? 90s real, with Patricia, real engraving. Real engraving so with Patricia, color anodized. Patricia did that. She was uh, my wife. She was the first one to engrave titanium. It was we were we were the show, and um, I think my maybe my knives were three, four, or five hundred dollars. I don't know somewhere in that range. And and Steve Lindsay was at the table next, so right. I asked him what it would cost to engrave a knife. What was it about? four or five times what my <laughs> knife sold for. So Patricia said, well, I could do, she, she was already doing scrimshaw and she was uh, quite exceptional at that. She said, uh, you know, I could do that. So we bought a Gravermeister and wow. uh, and uh, she, uh, it was quite a struggle with the titanium, but yeah, titanium by is. then I just found titanium, you know, uh, and I mean found, you didn't get, you didn't call up and order that stuff back then. But um, what year would this have been? Uh, 83, 84, somewhere in there. Uh, jewelers were jewelers were using commercial pure stuff, right? Making, which is different, it, yeah. similar but different. You know, the soft stuff um, and and anodizing it. You know, so it was those two things. I I thought, well, if I bring this into my knives, now I got a good little uh, right. I, I was looking for the structural, uh, wasn't looking for it just for the liner lock at that time. I had to do a lot of experimenting to see if it actually worked there. Right. The early liner locks were all 440C liners. That's what I was using. When you were doing, I got to handle an, like an early, I'd have the, it had a Walker's Lockers logo on it, real long, skinny, beautiful, no detent. That was a stainless liner. That would have been a 440 440 liner. liner. That makes so much sense. Oh, look at it. it. If if you did that with titanium, it would feel completely different. This almost felt hydraulic. It, yeah, no, the titanium would. The the reason the titanium works is a, is a lot because titanium galls to other metals. Right. So anything moving, you know, whereas the the hardened steel, hardened steel on hardened steel is Great. nice yeah. and smooth. And so, huh. and but the springs were, were they were strong enough. You didn't need a detail. You couldn't shake one open, right? right? No, it was amazing. Like you did it, and you're just like, and, and, I would never have thought it would have worked. No, because I learned detent, right? If I if it wasn't for you, that process, like I wouldn't probably be making pocket knives because that mechan. The same reason that you started making liner locks was the same reason that liner locks have been the probably the best place to start for. Cause, how many so, generations so of simple it's, yeah. it's like I, I i did that because with simple jewelry tools um what could i make uh, i was looking for a knife can i can i make a knife that i don't have to turn around my hand like a lock back and push right. back here yeah. and can i do it with simple tools yeah. and i split all those 440c liners with a jeweler saw i mean i split all the titanium ones too i didn't have a mill or anything so then I could follow the curve of the handle with it. You know, it took a right. lot of jeweler yeah, saw blades. <laughs> you know, you went through a lot of those those little little blades. But but that was the idea to get the one one thing there was simple simple tools. But with the 440C, the, the end of the end of the spring tang is is same hardness as the blade. It's yeah. the same as everybody's adding an insert today. Right. You know, put a hardened right. insert on Yeah, it's it. like full circle. Y yeah. Because everybody carbonized. Every, first, they, people started heating the lock bars. Then they started carbonizing the lock bars. Then they went to lock bar inserts. Yeah, but the heating, the heating titanium, it, it um, changes the, the, right. the absolutely nothing. Yeah. It's like it put some color. <laughs> it's a little in oxide it. layer. Yeah, <laughs> um, th that that does nothing. But uh, and it and it red hot titanium um, gets oxygen in brittlement. Probably right. won't see it in a, a knife, right. but you'll yeah, never and see you're it. And that little tip, I think, was the concept. Like I I went straight to carbonizing because it made more sense to me. But that I think it was almost maybe the idea was that you're. Yeah, you're getting like, but in brittling, it's not necessarily hardening. It's like oxide layer was the value. Yeah, yeah, right. the, the oxide layer. If you get it up hard enough, you right. get, get a few micron layer of right. the, the oxide. But but that uh, it's not 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 a solution. Hardened steel. Most of the w ones I build now, I put a 440C insert on right. in there. You know, rivet, I actually rivet it in there. But but uh, yeah, st steel on steel and. Um, Titanium just has different properties that uh, 
the I did a uh, had a patent back. Uh, it went with uh, with the company when they went out of business, but it was for an aluminum liner lock frame lock with a round insert that would you could rotate as it wore you know but it right. was the same same concept you had aluminum right you, 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 which is makes a fine spring right and then now you've got you can put a you could put a carbide disc or a steel right. disc or a ceramic disc whatever you want to do the lock up and you're starting maybe you're starting to see, I feel like i just saw aluminum frame lock with a hardened face so that's like that's like a back around full circle kind of thing because for a long you never saw like an like an aluminum frame lock that didn't that didn't exist. no that was uh, I, I i uh i just saw the picture of the prototype i did i i uh, sent it off had it anodized huh. black you know and um put the little insert in there uh made several prototypes for the patent and um you know, um, um, yeah, the aluminum's light. It's lightweight. It's right. strong. Uh, all, the only part that's doing the work is the part hitting the blade. Right. Um, we're kind of stuck with the titanium thing right. because it is lighter than you know. Right. It's lighter. It's, uh, it's in perfect vogue spring. Though, too. I always struggle with that because I think that a lot, a lot of times, materials will they'll have they'll have a personality to them that everybody just assumes that that now is like the high end thing. Meanwhile, you look at like a knife from like Tim Herman or something and it's a stainless frame and it's absolutely beautiful. And certainly, yeah. Different, but it but if I were to do a stainless frame on one of my knives, I think people would automatically assume it was lower quality and it's like They would. Yeah, they it's they not would. The case. Yeah. You um know? You, you know, the 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 and there is something um, I don't know, something about the titanium itself when I when I That's cool. When I found out you could, you know, it's easy to, to torch heating it, you know, I was getting some color. But when I found out I could do the bath coloring, right. you know, there's a, a company in Arizona, he wrote his, his doctorate paper on the anodizing process. Who uh, is it? A Reactive Metals. Reactive Studio. Metals. I still buy stuff from Reactive. Yeah. yeah. Um, when he first, that was the only paper on how to anodize. And I, you know, I still have the same... <laughs> I still have the same anodizer I built from that, uh, you know, 35 years ago, you know. We got we got real in the weeds, but that swings it fully back around. So the knife that I saw that was engraved and anodized, if you don't understand the time period that that was done in and the processes, the way, like, that there was masking involved and yeah. selective anodizing, at this point now, like you'll see a knife that is laser anodized. It'll have a deep laser and, and you know deep laser engraving, and then it'll have anodizing laid over the top of that. It's still complicated. It's still it's yeah. still time consuming, but it's so different than what you guys were doing then. And she masked everything with there's a there's a, a tape. Uh, it's like a clear kind of tape yep. that and she would. You have to start with the highest color and and, and and an exacto blade. She, you know, her, her engravings were quite intricate, so the the masking time was, you know. Did she figure that out on her own? Oh yeah, yeah. She she there was no information on that is crazy. any of that. You know, this stuff. I mean, you could, hard to learn if someone shows you. Yeah, they could buy the tape. You could buy the tape, and they were doing that by just yep. putting little strips on something and anodizing, yep. and you get little stripes, right? Yep. But nobody was engraving it and using that process. Yeah. She was the first one to engrave titanium, and um, you know, and and I tried everything, making her every kind of tool. To, the, well, it's gummy yeah, and it's yeah, a weird material to to, to engrave, yeah. you know. And uh, there's quite a few engravers now. They got it down, right? And they got they got it down doing really some really great great stuff. But uh, yeah, when, with what she she was working with uh, at that time, it was all it was all new. And we we set ourselves in a, a little different spot then in the right. custom knife world okay you know i got color you know definitely and i went crazy with the color i got stuff that i see now i said oh where's my Just sunglasses boy yeah. oh my god look at all <laughs> you know fun, did though. i not know when to quit you know but uh you didn't i use a little color now but but no i had <laughs> i had some pretty 
pretty bright pieces, you know. And that was that especially then that was that wasn't common because this is like this is beginning like kind of beginning of tactical era. Yeah, the, I mean the the quote tactical uh, you know liner locks that I were making then I anodized all the bolsters dark gray you know i yeah. went to the full sp yep. you know that was the hardest wearing yep. and black micarta handles yep. you know that was that was my go-to uh, uh of that that type of uh knife we didn't call them tactiles we right. called them uh, self-defense knives sure. or something i don't know what we called them back back then but good beefy uh liner locks with the with the gray bolster and the the black handle you know i still like that look yeah i still like that look today you know yeah, for, for, the, for those early early pieces but uh but it, you know uh, always looking for that next thing you know i, I got bored there pretty quickly but yeah you got bored so was yeah. there a point where you were doing like those you know like tacticals or fighters utilitarian stuff and kind of the more art-based stuff simultaneously, or was there just like a full transition? No, I think I think I either did um, the pieces more more uh, the simple liner locks, and uh, or or I did one more as a canvas for Patricia to engrave. Right, and that was the two it's kind of the two different things and it but she couldn't you know it took so long to do the engraving so i and then i was looking at other locks and other materials so then i started trying to add um but the artistic part um that probably came um, when i started making the the blade locks i think okay uh, um and then what do, you, what do you think why do you think that is uh I think when I, I, th I think I, when I figured out I could stick the gold in the Damascus and stuff, I th that sort of opened up a little door. Okay, now, right. you know, and, and first I just little did circles and squares and whatever, and I've, you know, I've continued to re refine that. I, I think, you know, I've tried over these forty-three years to continue to. To grow, let's yeah. say, to uh, to keep it more than anything, to keep it interesting. You right. Know? Otherwise, otherwise, it's just work. If if it's, right. if it's not exciting, and I, I don't have a new thing, or an, it doesn't have to be a, a whole new thing. It but it has to be a, a, some new thing. Right. The small. Yeah. It can be a refinement. Yeah. The gold, like the gold details. I remember first seeing like the squares. Not really. That to me is like the type of embellishment that I like because it's it's different, it's interesting, it's refined, but it's not garish, it's not overdone. Like there's a lot of even in the like in the you know art knife world, like when people think of art knives, like what comes to mind, those were so it was so understated, but so um, intentional. When you started doing those, was that was that with a edm or were you doing it in a different process well in in laying the gold the i i think uh, i bought this little uh uh harvey mac burnett and i each bought one of these little it was called a tap disintegrator so it, it okay it's yep. used yeah. in a similar process to edm but it's just a it's it looked like a little stereo box mm -hmm. and had a tiny little <laughs> uh, a real little uh not much of anything but but you had one shot at it you know if you could get it get it to burn right you could you could uh, um, you could make a hole and and then you'd you know fit a piece in there so I huh. the first uh, first gold I put in a knife was I don't think it was a blade lock it was a one of the little levers or something I I drilled a the pivot pin that goes through the side and, and I drilled all the way through and I wasn't supposed to. So now I got this three quarter finished knife and I got this hole I have to cover up, okay? And I'm going, how in the hell am I gonna fix this, right? <laughs> so it's like Ray Appleton said, it's not what you make, it's what you save that counts, right? I Man, that's the <laughs> truth. So um, that was the first piece I put gold in, I, you know, so I put a piece there and I put a bunch of other little inlays around it, you know, so, you know, and it was functional, but, sure. uh, but, uh, save the knife. So th then, uh, you know, uh, 
figured that process, uh, I could continue with that process. And, um, you know, about eight years ago, I bought, I bought a, a, a real, <laughs> you know, an old one, but I bought a real EDM machine and sort of changes things a little bit, but it doesn't do any analog, better job, right? right? This completely analog. I mean, you're, you're essentially, I, I've never, I've never really messed with, with a sinker, but I kind of understand it. So you have, you essentially have a, like a, what is it? Like, what's the material itself? Well, you can use graphite or, or copper. Graphite, okay. You can you use, use brass. And so, and so. I, use, I use the more intricate things I do are all, all, all graphite. Okay. Yeah, and I, you mill that into a shape. Yeah, I make, I make, I'll usually make that piece on the pantograph. You right. Know? And, okay. Um, uh, and then same for the, the inlay. The, the the inlay the same thing I'll make it on make it on the pantograph as well right know? and so then essentially so electro discharge machining right yeah you could make a you can make an EDM machine if the C I think it's on YouTube or wherever there used to be one where you have got a twelve volt battery and a light bulb and some other stuff and basically you're you're making something where a, when the spark hits the metal like a spark plug a spark hits the metal it melts one microscopic little piece of metal and that little piece of metal goes away. Okay. And then if you can control that spark with a, with a graphite or copper shape, it will, you can take a square piece of copper and it'll drill a square hole. If you can keep it uh, going, right. um, it's going to take that square shape and keep etching it. It's basically etching it through through the metal as that little each little spark buh, 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 pulls off a little microscopic and super accurate too right i mean it's very, well the, if if you got the, all the settings right yeah there's okay. an over your the, the the square piece of copper let's say that's going to burn a hole it's going to make a bigger hole than, than right. that so and you're it's how you can it or it's how you control that with the with the speed and the flush and you're doing this in a RAM EDM, you're basically using kerosene, you know, and, uh, as a yeah, it's a dielectric. So, it. okay. so it's in a bath. It's submerged in in this. So you've got an electric spark down inside this bath of kerosene. Now they there's more there's other fluids, but uh, Ray Appleton was the the you know the guru there. Uh, he he'd worked with EDM his, most of his life. But, you know, I remember asking Ray, well, what's the difference between kerosene and EDM fluid? And he said, about 50 bucks a gallon. <laughs> <laughs> so, it Was Ray the first? Because this is, like, people aren't using EDM. I mean, they use EDM in production, wire EDM. There's things for cutting. But the way that you use EDM is very rare in knife making. Can you, like, Ray did it. Ray did. Yeah, he did it in in his business before he ever made knives. Which he had like tool and die maker or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he he did he did uh, had had a shop doing you know okay. machine, little machine shop. Yeah. So di did you start that process? Learned from him? I, I just learned what it what it was. I I knew knew about it some, but I couldn't find a machine. That's you know when I found right. this little tap disintegrator. But but yeah, Ray was a it was a big big uh, big help and influence. You know and uh, um, and uh, he had one ancient old and if you see if you've seen his uh, his uh, knives. Yeah. He had one ancient old. Uh, uh, Charmy EDM machine, you know, and he had one surface grinder and one jig, one jig bore, and a dirt floor little shop. That's what you know. Uh, people to think of the work coming out. It's, all, it's always amazing to me, is because you see the finished pieces, you never know the environment that they were made no, in. No, and every once in a while, you see an environment, and you're like, how? How the hell did they do that? Yeah. Um, funny, uh, we, we had dinner with Flavio Acoma last night. When I first saw Flavio's knives, it was like this, this moment, they were these wild carved, like they were CNC'd and they were carved or like, they were crazy. So inspired. And then I saw a video and at that point he was like using a drill press cause he's down in Brazil. He's using a drill press, a milling machine. And I just instantly felt bad about myself. Cause I'm like, I can't, I can't do that. I didn't, he's seeing it and just making it happen. And that was like one of the, where you just realized like, oh, the work is not, I think a lot of people look at it. I think it was you that you said, like you thought knives came from factories, right? There's a point when you yeah. think about knives and you're just like, it's a produced product. Long time before yeah. you're making knives. Yeah. I remember the first time somebody told me 
that one of my knives looked like it came, like it looked like it was production. And at that point, I was offended. When I look back on it now, it was actually a really big compliment. Sure, sure. Because they were just like, this looks like a, you know, it's like an iPhone, like a product yeah, that was made right. by people that know what they're doing. <laughs> like, that's pretty <laughs> right. damn cool. Right, yeah. He did. Those knives, the, the Ray Appleton knives, that's like, you, he Where was so far from? ahead of his time. So he, was, far ahead. he was so far ahead of his time, you know. Uh, you know, and, uh, and he was a really good friend. He'd come down and uh, visit us and uh, ha hang out for a few days because he lived in Colorado and he'd come down to Taos, and and he'd come and hang out and um, you know. So uh, when you were when, when was that? That would have been ninety around nineteen ninety, I guess, late eighty, early ninety, somewhere in there. So maybe this—I don't know if this question I will think. actually make any sense. But is there a period of your work where you kind of made the most kind of like friends or connections at, with makers? Like, is there an age where you made your your kind of group? No, I. I, I I, you know, most of my friends were, you know, collectors and makers that I'd see at the shows because at right. home, at home, when you're doing 100 hour weeks, you don't have time to go hang out with the boys, yeah, right? It's very know? different. And that was, I did that for decades, you know, yeah. that's what it took to make a, well, let me regress. So when I started making knives, very few knife makers did this for a, a living. Right. No it, it was a big deal when you'd see them put a little ad. Now a full-time knife maker. Yeah. Okay, that everybody had a real job. Mm -hmm. I never did. I went in that little log shop I made on January the first, nineteen eighty, and said, "Today I'm a knife maker. Sink or swim." How old were you? Mm, Thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, somewhere in there. You know, something, something like that. But, uh, yeah. you know, it was like, uh, th this is it. You know, I'm, um, I'm, you know, I was still probably selling a load of firewood here and there. But but um, that was what I was you, doing. Were you selling jewelry, too? Yeah. Or just here and there? No, some. some um, I, had a, I had a gallery in, uh, I had a gallery in Santa Fe and Taos, but that wasn't, it wasn't doing enough to, to, right, to, to feed to, you. Yeah. Nah. Not, not really. The firewood was actually a better. <laughs> it's funny how that works. Yeah, it was man. a little more instant, you know. You didn't have to wait for somebody to sell some, you know. Yeah. We were uh, selling loads of the sagebrush in there, you know. We had, uh, so uh, me and my uh, partner at the time, you know. So, yeah. So it was, um, um, you know, and I had other skills like I I'd mentioned, but I, you know, I, I didn't want to, you know, didn't want to be in that uh, that world, so. Um, yeah, it was like, um, let's, uh, let's try to make this transition, you know, yeah, and, just do uh, it. it is a lot, it's a lot of time. People, I look back, I started when I was 19 and I didn't, I could be, I could work all the time. Didn't have anybody dependent on me. I could make no money. And I don't know, like if you put me 10 years in with obligations, that's a hard decision. Like I look at it in a way, I feel like I almost got an easy out because I didn't know any better and I could be hungry. It's, it's a hard shift. It's still a hard shift. I'm always amazed when people are like, quit my job, I'm going yeah. full time. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's, it's a commitment. It, it is because there's a, it, it's a completely different thing to make knives and make knives yeah. that, for a living yeah um and there's a bunch of different ways to go about that yeah. as well you know whether you you're making uh, more pieces or less pieces or which market you're trying to hit or, yeah. or whatever is more maybe more complicated now than it than it i think it, 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 it we were talking about that a little bit last night i think people People have two thought processes. Like, I think a lot of people realize how easy the transfer of information is now. So you can learn. You can go on YouTube and you watch someone build a knife. 20 years ago, you couldn't do that. No. Longer than that, you couldn't even find a, an internet forum where you could ask somebody a question. You're sending a letter or you're asking them at a show. But you made a really interesting point, which was there was also a lot less competition. And I... I hadn't thought about it in that way before. Kind of when you were like, when I look, okay, you, you and Patricia are doing engraved titanium. You're doing that, and that's new. I remember talking to Bob T about like G10, and realizing like you're like one of the first 
couple people, they put G10 on a knife. That's a very different time. Like I can't imagine that now, right? So less visibility overall, but like less, less noise overall too, maybe? Well, that's, you know, now it's like, yeah, the information's right there, but it's there for and everybody. It's there for the the most motivated guy or the laziest right. dude around, you know, just right. to click, click, there's the information. What do you want to do with it? Right. But but yeah, back back then you had to you had to be pretty pretty determined to find yeah. uh, you know, uh find what you needed, find equipment with you know, all the stuff available now, but it's available to everybody. So yeah, I've thought about that. Who I wonder if that's why there's so many like icons like from that era, cause like only the be like the best of you stuck. Like you really had to want it. Yeah, you had to, you know, you had to be pretty com committed there to, yeah. to uh, there was a lot came and went, you know, a lot of, right. a lot of guys came and went, you know. Um, Still that made good stuff. Good they, stuff, right? They, like, they, they that's the, the hard part of this, is, like you said, making of the knife a lot, I think for a lot of us is the easiest part. That's the, or, or the part that connects the most, maybe it's the business elements. The over a long term, like you have to, you have to keep your interest. Have you ever, have you ever gotten like burnout? Have you ever gone through a period oh, well, where yeah. you were like, I, yeah, that, I don't want to do this? All those those titanium sculptures we we're talking about. That was the time I was I was up to here really? with that, and so I said, okay, I'm gonna do some. You know, I was I was fortunate enough to know two very famous. Uh, both have passed now sculptors you know and they they're in the warehouse next door to to uh, uh, uh you know and, and i'd help the one he couldn't physically you know i'd help him move his sculpture around but he had a centerpiece in the rockefeller collection stuff like that but but i could see those guys struggled right. you know to sell any i could see it was no way in hell i was going to make a living doing sculpture but i got that out of my a little out of my system. I did a few pieces. They were okay, you know, but, um, um, gives you enough of a break. Yeah. Um, do you, what about it at this point? So like, I'm at a point in my career where there are questions and there are struggles and I'm, I, I look at certain elements and I'm like, I don't know that I enjoy this aspect as much anymore. And I'm looking like kind of always trying to figure out like, where, where's the move? How do I keep the interest? And for me, it's, I think it's learning. But there's a, like this balance point. So at this point, for you, like what's the carrot? Um, uh, you know, I have to, um, you have more, to. you know, yeah. uh, you know. There's, there's a big no, part of that for me too. Yeah, yeah. there's no, there's no, uh, uh, the custom knife maker ret retirement's probably not. You usually you know. go, go to your drop dead, but. Right. But so I I have to, but I probably do it anyway. Right. You know I I, I love the process. Um, I don't care much about having to go sell anything. You right. know um, um, I don't care for that part so much. But I'm only making five, maybe six knives a year, going full time. So um, um, I've you know I've worked myself into that corner, let's say. But so. Um, yeah, I, I have to I have to beat on myself a little bit to find that next motivation for each right. each one, you know. And um, but but once I get started, huh? yeah, once you started, that's the thing, yeah. right? Like yeah. once you get into the once you're in the flow of it, it's easy, or it's or it's motion. But like that start point, man, if it's not there, that's like I try to be I try to be grateful for like like the muse of it. Like if I'm feeling inspired and I really, yeah. I try to look at it and like, thank you. Thank you for coming <laughs> back. Don't leave and hang out yeah. with me for a little while. Yeah. That's a, uh, you know, that's what I was telling you about, you know, the false starts and all these things that yeah. I started, but they, they just didn't, they just didn't blow my skirt up, you know? So I got to, what is going to, you know, get me going here. And that's harder as I went along, you know, before, Early on, I had 10 things I wanted to do today. Right. Okay, I got 10 ideas. I got to get them, you know, I got to try this stuff. And But as, I, as I've gone on, I don't have, have that. So it's, okay, I need to find the thing I can land on here. And and, and then it, it always, uh, once I, that first step, you know, once I get going, then I'm, then I'm going. You yeah. Know? And, but I can't do anything. I, I can't multitask, okay? Man, I, that's hard. I do that and nothing but that. 
um, you know, um, six and a half days a week. Sometimes I ride, the, you know, I ride the mountain bike on Sunday. But how but, many days only Sunday? Do you ride more? No, than I ride during the week as well. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But not not the big, you know, not not several hours, you know, just yeah. enough that I'm, you know, I'm I'm hammered and can't yeah, really yeah, go yeah. in the shop and do anything, you know, during you the week. You ever mess with making bike parts? Uh, I made the you know the disc brake adapters on my on, on, on my old titanium frames, but no, no, I, I it's like somebody brought uh, he had a stem, a titanium stem, and he wanted it short. You know, and you know you've seen my titanium. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can weld titanium, and I says, dude, I am not welding your stem. Yeah. That's, <laughs> That's a life or stakes. death kind of <laughs> kind of thing. You know, I am. Not, yeah, I could do it, but I'm not going to. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like the, but God, the the technology, just like with knives, with knife, with uh, bicycle parts yeah. now, you know, um, that's all, uh, there's no, you, there's no real, except so for frames, fast. they yeah, still hand make frames. frames, but otherwise, yeah, no, that's high tech, Yeah, high tech stuff, just like. Pretty fun, it's funny, in a roundabout way, bicycle building almost kind of, kind of was one of the starter points for knives for me, because I, I used to race BMX and ride BMX, and I was like, my a life from probably 13 to 19 and I was trying to figure out how to leave home and I found a well I found job Corps, which is like a like government run like right. training program and I was like I'm gonna go there I'm gonna learn to weld so I can build bicycles and I went there and I don't remember what happened but I ended up working in a shop that made body piercing jewelry and that was my first introduction to titanium instead of bike parts instead of bike parts <laughs> and it just stuck. The the machining and the titanium and the finishing stuck. And everything else went away. And that I made a knife there and then it was like oh, it was done. So it was done. A... That was where it kind of originated. And then the bike thing was nope. still a bikes, but it but it for some reason in there it's almost maybe like what, how you felt about jewelry. Something about the knife is like an all encapsulating product because it hit it's that functionality thing it's also just like a primal thing there's a real like i love i always loved weapons and so like a knife was like from that standpoint it's like this tool it's capability it's really it's sexy and it has the details that keep it yeah, interesting yeah, yeah it, you it know? uh it's got and you know what is a custom knife maker as compared to other crafts arts and crafts you could make a knife, go to a show, deal directly with the customer, yeah. and take all the money. Take all the money. That, which is like, <laughs> yeah. jeweler, you're not doing that. No, you're giving half to a gallery yeah, somewhere. Yeah, or an artist. A or, sculptor, or, yeah. a painter, or any, uh, 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 mo most other stuff. You could do why some craft that? fairs, but that's a tough, tough what's road. The, what's the, why? Why is it different? Because we're not, here, okay, this is a good one for you, because you are the, you're like a pinnacle of art knife, is Art knife at this point is is it in fine art, or is the utilitarian nature of it? I've always had a you know art 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 knife. I think yeah, it's a knife with more artistic uh, elements. But it, is it is it art? I I don't know. I I um, I'm I'm not sure. You know. Um, the fine art snobs have always stuck with just you know uh, paintings and sculpture. That's, that's right. That, that's that, fine art. This is a weird thing. It's but sculptural, there, right? Yeah, but there's there's ceramic. There's ceram There's a ceramic piece that just sold for I don't know tens of millions of dollars. You know, right. um, uh, uh, so there is high craft in right. in um, and where that division is 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 always going to be a. Um, you know. That's like the, I read a paper a long time ago. I think it was called um, "How Fine Art Killed." Maybe it was "How Fine Art Killed Craft" or something like that. But it was—it's essentially like the idea that craftspeople, at a point like high craft, were pushing toward they wanted to be fine art or something. And there was like this major distinction. It makes no sense now because I'm not giving it good context. But it just like sparked that memory of yeah it's, it's so strange because you look at something like okay sculpture right if sculpture can be fine art and you 
have a background in sculpture, you have like you, there's an artistic element, like the origin. That's why I asked the question of, do you look at it as a tool to start or is it an artistic process? No, I, it, form follows function. It's a tool. Right. So it's if a you tool. see a tool. You, can, you know, what's that old, you can put lipstick and on a ribbons on a pig, but it's still a pig. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's, it's like, yeah, you can do all that, all the embellishment. The, you, but to me, there's some, some more simple pieces that are sometimes absolutely, absolutely art that, 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 that some with way more complex and embellishment to me aren't. The, the complexity and the embellishment definitely doesn't push it into art. And I agree. Some like you see things that is closer to industrial design where you look and you're like, I mean, it's art. Does it, I don't, I don't know. This is, these are the kind of questions I think that we internalize and no, like mm, sure. no one's worried about, no one's thinking about, but you look at it and you're like, I just wonder, I'm like the price point, does price point dictate fine art? Not really. Does the fact that it has a utilitarian origin preclude it from being fine art? That seems strange. It if shouldn't. It shouldn't. But pottery. it's like, like you know, like um, pottery and other metalwork and other things that are still utilitarian things are. Um, and I, that line's a little more blurred now than it was Is it? some years ago. I think so. I think so. Yeah. It was, uh, um, um, I mean, in art, if you follow art at all, you'll see that you know, you know some of the sculpture stuff now where you can just take two boards and nail them together sure. and throw a piece of paint at them or something and that's sculpture. Sure. You know, whereas I still think of that as you, you need some skill to do something, you right. know, uh, even if you're an artist, but um, that, that, that's a little more blurred now. Maybe, you, maybe you don't, but, but you definitely agree, need some yeah. skills to make a knife, but to be a, yeah, to yeah, be a sculptor, very... you don't, you know, you can glue some wood together and, uh, and do whatever, you know? So. Right. Yeah, the varied the varied skill thing, like we're get, we you have to learn to be proficient at a lot of things. And when, but when I look at my overall skill set, like I'm not a good machinist. No, I'm not either. <laughs> right? Like, but but you learn you learn in a way that allows you this this flex. Of, I don't know. It it's it's such a curious field to me, and it, with different makers doing different things visually on the same platform oh, wild like in i have zero i have zero interaction with the art knife world right where where is the art knife what do you think like it is now like is the art knife market stronger not as strong over the years like where is it i i i i think it's um peak has come and gone Really, for for the time I've been doing it, yeah, the um, um, things have changed changed a lot, a lot there. Um, there's less um, less new young makers going that direction, you know. So uh, why maybe do you think that, that is more because of the skills necessary? I I, I think. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's economics. So, uh, you know, uh, style, style to aesthetics yeah. probably might play a part who over the years, like who have you mentored makers? No, not. Have you worked closely enough with makers to heavily affect their trajectory or their work? Do you think? I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think so unless the, you know, a, a lot of them, you know, message me and tell me how much I influence them, but they only from them but visually look, you, looking, right. right? Um, very few, uh, I've never had, uh, makers where I've physically been there teaching anything right. to speak of that I can remember, but I do, you know, I answer as many, uh, technical questions as I can yeah. that come to me, you know, I, I, uh, especially now I seem to be getting a lot with the pantograph, you know, I, there are a lot of them are getting a pantograph and, and, um, they need help there, but, but, um, uh, some of them don't want to, don't want to put in the hard yards put to get where time, you need yeah. to be. You know, they want that short, quick, quick, it up. uh, thing. And there, there isn't, but, but so, yeah, I try to help and answer all, all those technical questions that I get um, through as much as you can there. You right. know, I'll give all I can there, but, but, but uh, point, yeah. having somebody in my, in my shop, you know, trying to, 
I, I had a young man, you know, he's making some, uh, he shipped the damage steel for me. You know, he'd saw off a foot and wrap it and ship it for me. And he helped clean in the shop and stuff to use my equipment because he right. was making knives, you know. So, and, uh, but after year, year and a half, you know, um, I remember I gave him a little number 57 drill bit. Okay, that's, that's, uh size of two needles right it's pretty sm pretty small but it's something i use a lot and i right. you know i said here go sh go sharpen this for me right <laughs> well he couldn't have, he couldn't have sharpened a half inch drill bit he had no absolute clue and i could see you know i thought about it at that point okay five years from now if i spent a lot of time he might be helpful okay it's uh, a hard he might be helpful yeah. uh, for what i do and you know for what i do one at you know one at a time so i you know um in the end he, he moved away and i didn't have to uh, deal with deal with the uh, well this isn't going anywhere yeah. you know <laughs> but but you know and uh yeah i guess so, so i help where it could but i've never had anybody where i, I don't think why, I'm why do you that. think why do you think our industry is more open with this going back to like even the art side of things why is our industry more open with information than other crafts because we're very open yeah that, for as many special now we are not always the the case you no know? no 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 everybody was the very uh, when i started they're very very secretive a lot a lot of them some guys very sharing you know, sure. like, like i remember george heron he would you know he'd tell you everything you you wanted to know you know but it was always at the shows you know never in somebody's shop i i guess huh. knife makers did go to other i i didn't but you but, so you never like generationally that was pretty common like my, my maker way we were talking about loveless a little bit and like there's guys that went through loveless the shop yeah you know like yeah, he'd have a helper and he'd then, have a helper or, I, I always am interested in lineage so like on my side like i the first knife maker I really met was Joe Cordova, and me too. Really, really? Well, when I got my guild list, I had to find three knife makers to look at my work and sign my thing. Right? No kidding. And and in New Mexico, in driving distance from me back then, yeah, yeah, it was it was Joe Cordova, and then I think I found two other guys at a show somewhere. No so, kidding. So, but yeah, so I Joe's one of the I've been in Joe's shop. I've been in Ray Appleton's shop. And one or two other knife maker shops. That's the only ones I've ever been in. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. See, it's the connections that where where I was going with that was like Joe had worked in the Loveless shop for a little while. Oh, I didn't you know. Even know and then I worked with with Bob T for a little while. And you start to like the lineage thing is really interesting, but not not everybody has crossover. And then there's big gaps. So like I would have just assumed either that. Over the years, somebody worked in your shop with you. Well, or Bob you, Bob T came right. to learn to make a folder, right. right? He just just one. We just spent one day. He came up to the house, and and I I've been I used to pick him up on the way to the airport. Sometimes we'd share a ride, but so I've been in his shop just to stop in there, but I never working there or anything. Okay, so we can we can back up on that one for a minute because so was Bob making folders? No, no, Bob made straight nuts. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and say there's, there's like a, some influence there because he was making straight knives. You helped him build a folder. He, he said he wanted to learn to make folders. Could he come up to Taos to come up to the shop and learn to make folders? That's pretty amazing. I mean, so I learned, I was making folders when I started to work for Bob, but I learned to make folders from Bob that like in my mind, the way he works and like, I mean, you know, Bob, Bob, the way Bob works is different. Yeah. Right. That's that. So that's like what I mean in that lineage where it's like, it is a, that's, you had direct kind of hand. Yeah. I gave him that. the titanium to make his, you couldn't, you couldn't buy titanium. So he, he came up to the shop and I, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I showed him a, a, a general, you know, general concepts of, you know, how, how, how I make a folding knife, but I made, you know, then I still made probably slip joints, lockbacks, and uh, and liner locks at that point. But it, oh, wow. it, You're in hindsight, he was only interested in the liner lock. I, I didn't, right. you know. So, <clears throat> yeah, so I gave him, gave him some titanium, and he went and uh, um, did his thing. So, wow. And that, that opened the, that's how the floodgates opened. Right. You know, for, for quite a few years, I was making liner lock, but... 
but the other makers stayed away from that, right? right. That, that was mine, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, when Bob started making them, then everybody, th it was like, well, Bob can do it, you know? So it was like, it was in like one, two years, right. this explosion, right? It's interesting that, that the floodgates happening, there's always a tipping point. Like a lot of times you even just see it around like general styles. If one person's doing it and it's kind of a style, it's people, I think for the most part, pay attention. Less so now because, because there's so much noise. I think a lot of people have no concept of where certain things originate or that things even originate with a person, right? But it takes that, it's like a trickle down effect. And you're like, like Loveless, again, like you look at how many makers make Loveless pattern knives. There was a point where that didn't happen. No, then right. that's where, you know, and, and uh, Skaggle yeah. influenced Randall. Randall influenced Loveless. Right. <laughs> Loveless influenced uh, uh, hundreds of guys. Hundreds, yeah. You know, and um, then we, we, we went from there, you know. But, but that's that, when the floodgates opened, that's when I said, well, screw this. I'm on to something else. I need to find something else. I'm not just going to be in the mix here not just gonna, so uh, was that was kind of the cat was that the catalyst for moving forward into other mechanisms it was sure, no kidding sure yeah you know uh, that's wild what I, was the first mechanism after that i patented a button lock in 85 it's not not a bad mechanism for what i could make with those tools i wouldn't make that probably make that mechanism what, tooling wise then what were you working with uh, I had no, no, I had a little uh, tag, you know, laid. Yep. <laughs> I wore the bed out on two of those, you know, Probably making them. making screws. But um, uh, I had that. Um, uh, I still have the same Bird King belt grinder I had then. And um, I had no surface grinder, um, no milling machine, um, but just the basic, you know. Just basic, uh, yeah. A drill press. I had a drill press, you know, a heat treat oven. What, with patents, it's always an interesting thing. Like, as a maker, is there, like, is there a value in patenting a mechanism on your own? When I did the talk at the, the Blade Shows, one young uh, knife maker asked me about the patent thing, and I, and I told him, today you can get a provisional patent, which you can do online for, uh, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you're protected for 12 months, you can go sell this thing. Right. But to do a, a patent, the patents I did um, back then, I looked back, I found a retired patent attorney, Air Force guy in Albuquerque. I'd meet him at a, a Blake's Lotta Burger parking lot, and, uh, <laughs> and he, did, he did the first patent for me. But even that was, was almost a year's wage for me. Right. Okay. So, so re yeah, you're yeah, all in. I mean, yeah, because there was no provisional. So you either had to patent something, or um, uh, somebody could take it. Right. As soon as right. you, you know. So, but now with the provisional patent, uh, um, an artist or a craftsman or a maker has uh, can protect themselves a little bit and go you, you go find somebody. You know, you can you can sh you got twelve months to show that and sell it. Right. But I quit, you know, I could have patented probably six or eight other gizmos, right? But I, I could not see, I could not see the financial. Right, because uh, then you have to defend it. Well, that's like the, like the collaboration stuff. That always seemed like one of the benefits. I've never had anything I need to patent, right? But like the collaborative side, that's always seemed like a pretty good method. Like you go through a company, the company patents it, you're on the patent. Like there's ways of. And then they actually can defend things in a way that you might not. You can't. You, know? you can't. You know. Um, you can't. As a as a knife maker, you will never be able to defend that yeah. patent. I, you know. I I uh, I learned that. You know that you you don't have enough money. Right. It's all. You know how much. You know, patent attorneys are four or five hundred bucks an right. hour. I think so. <laughs> when yeah. when the when the trouble starts, right. you know, you're, you're looking at more money than we make in a year, right. you know. Yeah. To, so unless you've got a really good idea, yeah, um, yeah that, that, that's a... That. Well, it's common. I mean, a lot of people will say like, oh, is that, did you trademark it? Did you copyright it? Did you patent it? And unless you're kind of involved in it, you, you know, I mean, the ability to change something just minor or 
or the, like the shape. There's a there's actually I mean for the most part in our industry there's there's I think there's a lot of honor because something that's a shape that's recognizable the trade like the trademark things you actually for the most part usually get a run with it like you said someone at some point will do it and then someone else will do it and then it's kind of out I think for a lot of people it doesn't actually affect them right I don't and that's why I don't know not, like the probably. liner lock would be the best question this is literally the best question of all time because that is the prime example of that happening because that is that's actually a mechanical detail overall like over years benefit not benefit would it have mattered would it would it have if i'd have had it business? yeah, yeah. Uh, well i i actually you know everybody kept saying you should patent that i didn't know what a you know really what a, even what a patent Back was then, right and um he, he, Patricia and I together gross 4,800 bucks, okay? We're both of us going as hard as we could, okay? <laughs> and when, what a patent costs, you know, but, uh, but I got an attorney in Albuquerque, but he did not understand the mechanics. And six months had already passed. You only have a year. Right. So then I spent a bunch of money and didn't get it anyway because the time lapsed. He didn't, right. he couldn't get it filed in time and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, but in, in the end, you know, probably better I didn't, you know, right. um, uh, in hindsight, uh, maybe I'd be retired by now if I did, who knows, but that's a hard, yeah, I don't know. But, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, but that's, that's just the one that actually took off, you know? Right. Um, well, and you might, if you had stayed being the, like the only person making liner locks, if liner locks becoming more commonplace were a catalyst for you to move into other mechanisms, there, there's like the very real possibility that, that you, maybe you wouldn't have done that. Yeah, I could still, I could still be making those great bolstered black handled things I was making 40 years ago. I don't know, you know, I don't know where that would have gone. I might have lost. I most likely would have just lost interest and moved on to something gone else. on to, the, you know, to build motorcycles or something. But, but uh, so, <laughs> but but you mentioned the trademark. You know, I I uh, trademark the name liner lock. Right. And and you go through a process where you get a no contestable trademark after a time. That's when you get first you get a C. I mean, first you get the, just a, the trademark TM, and yep. then you get a re R with a circle. That's a full registered mark. Okay. And these guys here will know more about uh, how that process works. But even after that, after so many years, then you get this. Uh, I think no contestability even mark. I even had that. And, and still had that trademark taken away from me huh. because it became so common. I couldn't, you, you have to, you have to defend every time anybody uses right. anything. Well, that right. was pretty, at some point that was completely impossible, right? right. It was, it was in print all over the world and, right. and uh, everybody's using it and, and makers, knife makers didn't understand that it wasn't a patent okay they're right. they're all a lot of them were in the beginning were really upset because they thought now they couldn't make a liner lock because and it has nothing to do with mechanics right. it has only to do with the word right yeah you know and stuff so but um it it became like kleenex you know uh the word is is it's so common so ubiquitous that it, it's yeah, like bowie that you, is a clip point big clip point knife you, like it, so i lost that i lost that trade Trademark, but because of the uh, one of the big one of the bigger companies decided that they would they, they got the, they got and I wasn't going to spend lawyers right uh, you just not defending it. it I never made a nickel off of it anyway right. so why was I gonna why was I gonna go deal with that so I let that well I mean it, that's the from my perspective I mean I think it's one of the biggest advancements as cus for custom knife makers I think that advance the entire industry they're like where you know, like you know like love like loveless visibility origin like these things where it's like these little hit points that they're shifts the ability to make something with the tools that you have and that's like that's a paradigm shift all of a sudden it's accessible to more people um is there a reason you never went into automation um 
money probably and and you know space logistics yeah, i don't space. know i mean that's you know hard. i did set up not that. lack of interest no i mean i probably had the first cnc mill anybody i little, really that little dyna bench top they use in schools you know i, I didn't know that yeah i i you when, know you can drill hole in um 1990 yeah so you messed it's, with it's, it it was you know it was still dos uh, I still use it once in a while to drill some holes or something. Really? It's still I still run it on DOS. You still if you don't wow. if you if you don't know how to how to type out a DOS <laughs> thing and and uh, yeah the little uh, uh, yeah it's uh, but they use those in schools you know but it it doesn't have wow. ball, it doesn't have ball screws sure or, sure you know uh, but it's but it's got a quill which is uh, you know so if you're gonna drill a couple of holes sure. in a tooling plate or something I'll use it but. But, but I think when I, when I found the pantograph, um, I thought, you know, I, I, cause I'm only going to do one of something then. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, how, how much time would, uh, would the automation really, really, well, I struggle, me? I struggle with CNC. I think that the way that I learned to make knives for me is still, the process is very satisfying. CNC allowed me to change my business my goal was never to use the CNC for like big production, right? I wanted to do things that I was having a hard time doing by hand. And I realized that some repeatability would be nice, right? I still struggle with it. And I'm like 10 years in. And a lot of it is because I want to sit down and make one knife of something. And I'm slow enough with, you know, fixturing and CAD and CAM that it actually puts a big like stop point. In. And just recently, I've kind of given myself the space to be like, if I want to make a knife by hand, I'm just going to do it. And I'm not going to worry about efficiency. But it's it's over the last like decade, it's really been interesting to see like where CNC has come in. The panograph is kind of like having a heyday. It is, yeah. Which is very cool. They're so satisfying as a as a machine yeah um it's a magical thing you know which what you can what you can do with it if you'll take the time and patience to to do it and and i tried to get out of the box of what most people are just doing inlays with it. Right. that's been traditionally that's the guys would get a gordon pantograph and you make, make yeah. a hole and make a thing and stick it in there and you'd have an inlay and then do pr pretty accurate work right. that way but you know, I um, I use it for I do the, the sculpting on the handles with a giant you know pantograph that that you they give those away now. Nobody wants right. those big ones, you know, um, you know. But uh, it's like fifty five hundred pounds. I think that thing weighs. It probably cost sixty or seventy thousand dollars when it was right. when it was new and it was like the peak of manufacturing. Yeah, that's how it dies. You know, that's how they you, you know if you you know a blender uh right. thing you know that somebody had to make a die to to injection mold that piece you yeah. know and that's how it was done before cnc uh, and edm you know that was uh, somebody somebody carved a wooden master and then somebody <laughs> traced somebody it. stood there at that thing for days you know milling out a a, a die you know um on, on a pantograph so it's uh yeah it's it's a it's a uh, it's it's a great tool there's no there's no circuit boards to wear out or you know and it feel it's satisfying i think a lot of the work you said earlier like when it just becomes work that's hard there's yeah. there's something about the process of knife making and the steps of knife making that i think are like linear that makes it very interesting and like for knife makers i know a lot of knife makers i think that they've jumped around with interests a lot and then they stick on knife making and i think it's because of those like the work itself is is enjoyable but it also changes even just step to step you know one day you're on lay then you're on a mill then you're on a grinder then you're doing something by hand i think those things it, it just it creates just enough variability it makes for like a very satisfying workflow. It it does, and and you you you're you're right. You've got to you've got to be able to do a bunch of different things, yeah. you know, to to get to that end to get to that end result, you know. But it, the interesting and and we're all motivated by different things, and and for me it was growth, you know, and but but I see 
other makers that were quite happy. They they found something, and for thirty years they just keep knocking them out. You know, I've always I've I, always I, wished I could do that. I'd be I'd be locked up in the nut house. Yeah. You know, okay, but but it worked for them, yeah. right? And um, but we, yeah, we're all wired a little differently. So you got to find you got to find something that that sort of fits in how you're wired, I guess. You know, yeah. as much as I'd love to, you know. Because uh, my what I do is not a good business plan, you right? Know? It's like, we, uh, I think we we talked about that a little bit. Which some of this stuff is circular. So like I feel like every every generation we you kind of feel like you're figuring it out again, or like the problem like oh how do I scale this business? And then it's like if you want to scale, and you realize like you you've been through that too, right? Like you messed with the concept of doing your own like small batch production yeah. and building shops and. Where is the make or break? Like, how do you ultimately decide? Like, this is not for me. Is there a point where you do that? Is there? Yeah, I, I think you know if you you, you got to find that path that works. And, and sometimes, if you're just chasing the money, right? Maybe you're you're not as uh, content as you might be if you're just uh, if, you, if you just do what works best for the way you're wired. Maybe, right. You know. Yeah, it's fighting a weak position. Like it's great. Like yeah, more money is great. But if you if it's not, if that's not yeah. actually the focus, it's gonna you're gonna lose steam on it. Yeah, if you're not, you know, if you if you lose that passion a little bit, man, it's a it's a tough job. Then we talked a, about that. That's it's a balance. It, it's a real tough job once you lose that once you use that motivation there. You know. It just it just becomes another job then you know right um, if, if if I like I said I had other skills if I was just going to go get a job it was uh, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't be, be that, wouldn't it be wouldn't this. be grinding all day yeah. right? <laughs> but, you know funny I read a I read a Harvard Business Review on Reed and Barton that was probably from like the early 1900s and it was the first time I, I kind of had the realization like oh like craftspeople have been through this like time immemorial. And it was basically, it was basically the process of like a silversmith working by himself on a bench, getting busy, adding someone else. Well, those guys, okay, now one of those guys is managing two other people. Now the business is starting to change. And then, then they're scaling. And business was like around for like 200 years, but it was essentially the history of the industrial revolution. But I just never put it into context of like makers, right? Because you look, you look at the companies that are built over time, you know, like, um, like, uh, you're looking at Emerson knives and it's like custom knife maker goes up the line and builds some guys are wired for it. And yeah. it's really, really interesting. And depending on when you come into the industry, I think there's an expectation also of like, that's a trajectory. Yeah. And then, there's no trajectory, man. It's all over. No, no, that, that's, that ship is, is sailed. But, but you, you know, we were talking about that, you know, so different process were different different people so when I was at uh, got to go to the little village where they make all the high-end guns in, in Italy in mm -hmm. Gardone right so you go into I, I, I probably don't need to give their names but anyway you go, you go into the, this one shop and it was in a nice house below as a lot over there there's this shop you know state-of-the-art CNC everything. Yeah. Okay. And as he gives us a tour, you know, they make about 20 shotguns a year. Then we go to this other one, really old school, father, brother, a couple of cousins. Okay. Four, four guys in there, everything, little scrapers and all old school stuff. They make the same 20 shotguns a year, okay, at, at about the all about the same price. Just different processes of the way the they go they go about it, you know. Um, you know, di different l l ways to do those things. Different way, yeah, yeah, same man. Yeah. Italy, have you been to kind of like what I think of as like the knife capitals? Of like, okay, so no, Maniago, Solingen, Seiki City. Have you been to the different I've been places? To any, I haven't been to any of. Uh, oh, I've been, been to Solingen. Yeah, yeah. They, the museum had a uh, retrospective of when they for, did their first show. They did a uh, retrospective oh, of my fun. work there at the, 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 at, the museum, yeah. at the museum there. So I went to that. I went to that show there. That first first one there with. Uh, 
Yeah, it was great. They borrowed knives from all collectors all over Europe and all that's over. That's pretty so, cool. Yeah, it was uh, it was great. They uh, and uh, but that's the only you know only one I think I've been to this. So the only tier, reason that I've been tier frame. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, no, that's they had so, a show there. You know, some of the maker I didn't go. Uh, I was I asked. We were just in France. And I asked. I was like, where is the cutlery like capital? And they didn't know. So that's like like the Oppenels and the um, what's the what's the one with the B on the back? That's like the classic Laguiole. Laguiole, yeah. right? Yeah, that's uh, now I I uh, I did sell a knife to the museum in Nogent, France, the Cutlery Museum. They bought a knife from me, a blade lock, small one of the all steel ones, and I got paid by the French government. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I've never been to that museum either, but I guess there's a cutlery museum in Nogent, wherever that is, you know, yeah, in that area that around Tierra, I assume. I uh, wouldn't have been to any of them if it wasn't for collaboration. And that was, I was thinking, you've done collaborations over the year. I mean, we were, we were talking about this one earlier. This is 20 years old. About, I guess. Somewhere yeah. in there. Somewhere in there, yeah. What, what other collaborations have you done over the years? Because it, it, it wasn't, com this was not common this time period, right? No, no. Um, the, you know, I, I, I sold a patent to one of the other factories that are, are long gone. So I did a couple of starts that never. Never took off, That, that, yeah. that never uh, went anywhere, you know. Um, uh, when the whole thing started, uh, A.G. Russell, when the whole flood, you know, he he was going to do one, and I signed a non-competing oh, something. Yeah. I couldn't go with anyone else, and A.G. Oh. never made a knife. Okay, so <laughs> that's that's my good business uh, good business plan. So that's when everybody, uh, you know, and I'd send them to other other makers. You know, uh, um, uh, I did the one with Clotsley. And Spiderco together, the three of us. So uh, Spiderco, but Clotsley made the the first yep. ones in Switzerland. Yep, I remember those. And uh, I made that was the first carbon fiber knife, uh, as I, far as I, I know. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That was the first carbon fiber knife. Uh, I'd been trying to chase just like titanium. I'd been trying to chase that stuff down as soon as I, I'd heard about it. You know, to, but you couldn't get it in a form to make a knife with. I finally got enough. I can't remember if it came from the, the trip we did in Switzerland or not. But anyway, I made I made those prototypes for the for that piece and um, the handmade prototypes for that piece. And then Klotzley made a run in Switzerland, and then then Spiderco made a you know those lasted for a year. I still see those pop up here. I still see them. Yeah. Yeah, but that uh, but that I, and that was way back too. So I don't think any others. No. That's wild. Uh, yeah, I guess it, now it, I kind of came into the industry where, like, visibility-wise, you know, it's like you've got, like, Ken. And so, like, collaboration was always in my mind. And I always, like, marked it as, like, a level of success. Like, I saw, like when I first started designing for CRKT, like, it was kind of this moment of, like, big leagues. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, it really was yeah, a thing. You get, you get a knife with them, you really, you're, you are you got something if, going. Yeah, on. and I don't, I, I'm, I wonder now if for like newer generation of knife makers, if it's, if collaboration is something that is chased as much, but man, it's, I think it's been so valuable just as a learning process and also like guilt by association. It's like, pretty cool to be on the team with yeah with you. <laughs> like, i mean and, and and the reason i came the reason i came uh, uh i came to see them i had another lock okay and uh, so i flew up here brought my um, photo book uh, and but i had these i had the mechanisms for the lock with me you know and in the end, they there it wasn't what they were looking for, but they're looking through the, the book, and that's how we got here. That's how we got got to these, you know. I wasn't roundabout because I knew these guys and I trusted them yeah. from from before, you know. But I wasn't I wasn't gonna <laughs> take my mechanisms and just go out hunting around at the at the shot or one of the shows or something. No, I I wasn't. No, I I just throw it in the drawer. 
but uh, but yeah, so that's that's how we we started again. So the, you know, it's been great. Pretty cool so, man. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Are there any materials like I don't know if we've been talking about knife making too much. Are there any materials that you're like now? So you know, talking titanium, talking carbon fiber, all these materials that you're kind of were new. Is there anything that you are watching that you haven't tried or uh, want to or? No, I can't. I can't think of anything on that realm right now. Na- right now, I'm. Uh, you know, I'm uh, always kind of looking. You know, um, um, like stuff like carbo. You know, carbo quartz. I remember when that came out, and that was really interesting. I'm pretty simple. Like I like what I like, and so a lot of the new stuff that comes out, I just don't. Even, I don't mess with. Yeah, that. I like the laminated. You know, titanium stuff. You know, um, the, when it when it came out, but it's just too too much bling for me. Have you now. seen that crystallized titanium? Yeah, yeah. Not, and I had some of that. The, uh, the thin sheets. They've been using that in the same thing. They've been using that in the jewelry, the jewelry industry a long time. Yeah, now. yeah. And that's uh, that's pr- pr- there again, and maybe a little too much uh, for, visual. You know, yeah. You, you know, back in the late '80s, I'd have been, uh, I'd have had that on there. <laughs> And anodize as many colors as I could get on there, probably. You know? I was pretty fun. I, I catch myself doing it with anod. Anodizing is like as a process is so fun. I think it, if you have a lot of pieces, it makes it, it's pretty uh, enticing. Yeah. To just start to like work in color, you know. Lately, I guess like technology wise for me, um, like laser cutters and laser engraving. Have been the, the thing that yeah, really the, has been the, interesting. That that's changed and um, gone, you know, so much now. You know, well, it's affordable. Yeah, it's and it's and it's flexible. I mean, there's a there's a lot to it. You know. Yeah. Well, um, one of the jewelers from New Mexico, you know, Pat. Pat Fury, oh yeah. He's 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 uh, not knocking out of the park with that. He's stuff. crushing. So if it wasn't for Pat, I wouldn't be doing CNC. If it wasn't for body jewelry, I wouldn't have met Pat. So I met Pat when I was uh, 17 years old. Working, working at this place called Cinequinon, which was a machine shop that made body jewelry. And back then, it was Pat came in. He knew the owner. He looked like Anthony Kiedis when he had a rolled up cowboy hat, and big <laughs> earrings, and he, definite rock star. Met him probably ten years later through a knife collector, uh, and was like, "Hey, you guys are both in New Mexico. I want to introduce you." all pass cross it's so uh, it's such a strange yeah i felt from just from instagram i felt like i knew him but, but we've never met you, <laughs> you never met pat we've ne- never met no oh, uh, we, we have a lot of fr- we meet him this of, weekend yeah you meet him this week yeah we have a lot of friends in common yeah you know um uh, but uh, no he's one of the most talented people i've ever met yeah just, so he's pushing that laser uh, he pushes technology everything. yeah he like yeah anything he touches he i think he's like you in a way where it's the progression that is what keeps him he, going. He he's one of those artists that craftsmen that that has has I see the continual growth. Yeah, you know? constantly. It's and like, he's in an industry that doesn't always necessarily promote that. No, right. right like yeah. he's fighting tradition, and then he's growing and adopting. And you know, the knife industry. I guess the knife industry doesn't have much of that, right? It's like you were saying about the way we sell things. Like we go straight to the customer. We sell a thing to the customer. Gallery's not taking a cut. With the exception of, I guess, maybe the guild and certain things like that at certain time periods, there's no one really dictating what we do, how we do it, the style we do it. No, it's it's a it's a great thing. It was like I could have I couldn't have made it if I if I couldn't have done the the knife shows. I you know yeah. Uh, Trisha and I bought a one way ticket to the first knife show. Really, <laughs> New Orleans. Yeah, and uh, I assumed I'd sell everything and. Sunday afternoon, I haven't sold a damn thing. Oh, man. And I've charged everything at the hotel. I got no money for a plane ticket home. And uh, um, one of the collectors, actually, the guy that owns this restaurant, he, he came by and went and grabbed two other collectors. And uh, Sunday afternoon, everybody's packing up to leave. And he came by and bought some knives. Yeah. To this day, I still laugh when people with knives on the table leave on a Sunday. Because if it wasn't for Sunday sales, originally, there would have been a lot of shows where I didn't make any money. I used to I used to do the shows that I could drive to. So I would go to Denver. I would go to you know the I went to the Paul Bosch show in in Arizona. It was like right. the first show I ever did, and it was success was gas. 
like if I sold the knife and I could buy my hotel room and my food and my gas, that was a successful. Yeah, show. Absolutely, yeah. That and it was, was scary. A, that was, uh, <laughs> yeah. If if these guys hadn't bailed me out, I don't know what how we were getting back Man. from New Orleans, you know. So um, you know, but that yeah, there was only that that show only lasted one year as well, you know. That You've seen was, a lot of them come and go, huh? Yeah, yeah. What you, over the years? What's been your favorite? show uh new york you know probably probably just because of new york but you know, you know if you're living up in the mountains with yeah. with with uh n- no indoor plumbing or running water okay and and then you plop down in uh, in manhattan you know three days you know it's a treat you take it all in <laughs> everything and then I'm ready to go be a hermit again. And, and I did that for, th- you know, I did the New York twice a year some years, but I did that for probably 30 years, you know, so. Um, it was all, I, I, I've only done the Jersey City show, and I did that probably six years. But it was the same thing. It's it's actually, it was a great place to spend time with friends because you do the show, you make your money, you take the train into the city, and then you just get a nice time. You get to eat get to hang out see i did it the other way that new jersey show i was the only ones i'm staying in the city and taking that train to the show you did it right yeah, yeah you so, did a better way so, so that i could get up in the middle of the night and walk out and go get a piece of pizza or a beer or whatever yeah. you know it's uh, yeah new york city's hard to but, but then but you the, go home and it's quiet yeah then i go home when i'm a hermit again yeah but, but there's a lot of us but the American shows are nothing like the, you know, the European shows was where the, was always the most enjoyable. You know? Really? Yeah. Is it, was it just being in Europe or was <coughs> it the people, the culture, the... Yeah, they are the culture. You yeah. know, in, like, at, at uh, some of the, some of the U.S. shows, like, kids that have come up to the table, they have no, no they, they don't know how to handle or right. see things. Well, and that's really their parents don't know yeah, how to handle their kid bringing them into a knife shop. Whereas you didn't have to explain stuff there, there. You know, they understood that fine craftsmanship, you know. There was a lot less explaining. You didn't have to convince uh, so much, you know. I guess there was just the, you know, of, of that fine fine craft, you know. So, yeah, I wonder, there, the, I wonder why that is. They didn't grow up with it, you know. You just, yeah, you just grow up with it. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known what a, you know, um, the, the, you know what a what's a good watch and what isn't, right. you know. Um, right. You know, I I didn't grow up with it. That's that. like that's like culture culture of craftsmanship. I think plays or like appreciation for appreciation for object being able to differentiate maybe like the specialness of something yeah because that's the thing at the end of the day like ranking knives someone could just pick it up and use it to cut open a bag of concrete and they'll never see it as anything more than that yeah it's like you know i i i've said it for decades you know this this is this isn't brain surgery we're just making knives you know well, you do the best you can, but it, you know it's a uh, it's a it's a tool. Let's, it's a let's tool. make let's make a tool. That's yeah. I think that's what's so fun about this. Like when I first started doing collaboration, it was just about when some of my knives were harder to get, or I'd go to shows and I could do lotteries and actually sell everything I was making. And I grew up I grew up real lean, and so I'm not my own customer. I don't I don't have the money to buy like especially then like to buy the knives that I was making. And so being able to do production collabs was a really fun way of expanding and giving access. Cause I think that yeah. the design element is really fun. The, the, especially then too, like just watching these, like watching a production knife, like come through the process yeah, and seeing prototypes. Great. Yeah. So cool when you're making everything by hand, you know, but it makes it, it makes it so approachable. And I mean, for someone like you, this is a stratospheric change. Like the majority of knife collectors will not ever own a Walker. That is crazy. You have the, the, the visibility over the years. I mean, it's just there. So this kind of like, I think it's fun. I think it brings it back into perspective. It it does. Cause then you, then you got something that, that, you know, most people can afford right you know whereas yeah, yeah and, you and know, use five and or six knives and... a year i'm not gonna i'm yeah. not gonna supply you know um supply that you Jeez. know so. yeah pretty good 
feel like I feel like we have pretty nice. We, talk. we yeah. I feel like we should probably yeah. eat some lunch. Yeah, <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> man, it was nice talking with you, man. It's you too. You, this, that, that worked really well. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I feel like this. I could talk your ear off because you cause, you're more for your generation. You're way more knowledgeable of history than try well, any of I got, them. I'm most lucky, or though. any you know appreciate uh, that I, I try and i i got lucky with the people that i met early on and you start to see you see the history and then the history matters and it i think it informs everything that we do and i think it's a way to appreciate the work is to understand like why and where and it makes it special to me so yeah, well, well not, not a lot of people, you know, makers have gotten to sit and do this for this long, uninterrupted. No, yeah. like, that's I thought cool. they were going to pull cool. a plug on us here <laughs> at some point. <huh? laughs>